Welcome to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. In this podcast, we will focus on successful marketing methods for advisors that generate prospects and clients. We will learn from the best in the industry on how advisors in the trenches today are growing their practices. Join us for this journey where Brad draws from years of expertise and guest experts to help advisors reach their full potential. This podcast is brought to you by White Gloves Podcast Connect Program, a done-for-you, fully integrated podcasting system that will help you keep in touch with all of your leads. Welcome back to Be Advised, Leading with Value. This time around, your host, Brad Swinehart, is talking with Seth Green, a best-selling author and co-host of the Sharkpreneur podcast. Hey, Brad, Seth has had quite the journey from cold calling to million-dollar accounts. Seth. Hey, buddy. How are you doing this morning? Thank you so much for joining me. I am fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. It is an honor to be here. Awesome. 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 So, hey, well, let's let's hear a little bit about you. Where do you come from? I know there's some really great accolades that come before your name, but, you know, where did Seth get his start in the business? I am in Buffalo, New York, and have been here most of my life other than going to Syracuse University for undergrad and a brief stint in New York City. I got my start, decided to become a college financial aid planner, helping fin- helping parents cut the cost of tuition, $19,077 per year. I worked for a Fortune 500 company, AG Edwards, which obviously doesn't exist anymore because it got bought out twice in the subprime bubble burst. And when I started, I w- was told to make 300 cold calls a day, interrupting strangers, asking for their business. And oh, I love was, that. I love was, that. Just pick up the phone, smile and dial, right? That's right. This was decades ago. There was no internet. There was no direct mail. I mean, there was no email. There was no social media. So I did it. I didn't know any better. I made the 300 dials a day. I hated it. It absolutely was terrible. And then I had the good fortune to find and meet legendary marketing guru, Dan Kennedy. I begged my wife for 30 days in a row to borrow more than our mortgage on our new house to go work with Dan. Thankfully, on day 31, she caved and said, you better pray this works. It did. In less than two years, I was in the top 30 financial advisors nationwide for opening new accounts. And then um, I got written about in a whole book. This was all based on print advertising and direct mail. And I was written about in a whole bunch of industry trade journals about what I had been doing. And financial advisors started calling me, asking how do they do what I was doing? I faxed Dan and asked him, and Dan said, start a marketing company and help them. And that was almost, that was 14 years ago when I started marketdominationllc.com. It started out as just me and one advisor I was willing to let test my stuff. And then uh, since then it's branched out. We have an amazing team of 45, team members here, and we've helped thousands and thousands of agents and advisors um, literally around in every time zone pretty much on the planet. Wow. So, I mean, it it really went from smile and dialing, the grind, the thing that just absolutely eats at your, your soul, right? <laughs> yes, it does. And then, and then what was that catalyst? What, what turned that into a, you know, a hundred million dollar account? How do you, how do you do that? What was that? pivot point uh pivot so i decided i learned from dan that you shouldn't be cold calling that people should be calling you they should be pre-qualified pre-interested predisposed to do business with you know who you are what you do why you do it who you do it for and how much you charge and so there should be no first meetings and the very first thing we did was we i wrote a lead generation re- magnet a lead generation report i ran print advertising in magazines and newspapers targeted to my market in my area. It worked. My phone started ringing with qualified leads. So that sent me off to the races. How I landed the $100 million pension fund was I had, I originally interned um, in the business in college at Merrill Lynch. And when I graduated college, I went back to Merrill to go get a job and they refused to hire me. They said, we don't hire rookies go get your licenses, go build a book for five years, and then come back to talk to us. Wow. That that really made me mad. And in that meeting, the recruiting director had mentioned three times how they had just won a $100 million pension fund that was local. And that's why Merrill Lynch was the best. And we should, I should want to work there and work my butt off somewhere else for five years to come back to work for them. So fast forward a couple of years, and I had 
you know, gone to AG Edwards, making my smile on and dialing, started to learn from Dan. And then I decided, you know what, hey, whatever happened to that pension fund, just for the heck of it. So I came up with this strategy, which I think we're talking about later in terms of interviewing your ideal prospects, interviewing your ideal referral sources, and building a relationship that way that works much better. So I cold called the president of the board of directors of that union, not to sell him anything, but to interview him. I said, I wanted to interview him for my new book I was writing. And he said, yes, because it was a book interview, not a sales call. He, I did the interview. He enjoyed the process. And at the end of the interview, he said, you know, we have to put our pension plan out to bid every couple of years, every few years to do our due diligence. You know, pitch day is in two weeks. <laughs> we need a new advisor oh. to pitch. We're, we always have to add a new one every year. Do you want to be the new guy who pitches for our business? And I said, yes, I do. And frantically drove back to my office, burst in on my branch manager and said, how do I pitch for a $100 million pension fund? The only clients I have so far are like the 20 orphans you guys gave me. I don't have, I don't know what I'm doing. So he said- I like where this is headed. I like where this is headed. (laughs) He said, don't worry about it. We'll, St. Louis home office is going to write the pitch. They'll practice with you. And we're not going to let you touch the 100 million. You'll get paid on it but you're not going to manage it. I said, oh, thank God. (laughs) So pitch day came along. I was the last advisor to pitch. I went in and there were seven business cards on the table of the other advisors who had pitched before me. Um, This was 20 years ago. So I did something. I was young and cocky then and arrogant and I wouldn't do it now. But I picked up all the business cards and I ripped them in half and I threw them on the floor. And I said, you guys don't need these anymore. And I dropped my book on the table and because he was the last chapter in my book. So I dropped nine copies, you know, nine copies of the hardcover book on the table and slid one down to each member of the board of directors. And then I gave my pitch. They asked me after my pitch to wait outside. It was five o'clock on a Friday. Nobody else was there. All the other advisors had gone home. They were waiting for Monday to find out. And the receptionist was packing up to lock up the office and leave. So I just kind of sat there outside the waiting room and I could hear people yelling and like loud, angry voices. And I'm looking at her going, what the heck is going on? And she says, I don't know what you did, but I'm going home. So I was stuck waiting for about half an hour and they called me back in and they said, you know, half of us, half of us thought it was really rude and disrespectful that you ripped up those business cards and we wanted to kick you out. And our treasurer said he wanted to punch you in the face for being an arrogant punk. Ooh. And I, so I took a step back um, away in case they took a swing at me. And they said <laughs> the other half of the room wanted to give you the business because you're the only person who brought a book. Everyone else brought a PowerPoint. You wrote a book. You must be the expert. And I very nervously said, well, there's nine of you. Which half, which half, which vote carries the day? And they said, you got the business because you wrote the book. Nice. Nice. I love that story. That that's brazen. I'm just going to, we'll say it that way. That's, that's brazen to to rip up the other business cards and toss them on the ground. That's funny. Yeah. I wouldn't do that now, but I lucked out. It worked and I didn't get beaten up at the time, which helps. And then since then we've taken that process of how you interview your ideal referral sources like accountants and attorneys or how you interview your ideal clients in such a way that it turns into a podcast it turns into a book it turns into a whole bunch of social media content and it builds relationships and will dramatically increase the number of referrals you 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 get and and i would you know i've been a podcast host now for a couple of years and been on a few podcasts and and i have to say i mean it's a, it's very similar, right? When you, when you call up and you talk to someone and you invite them on to your podcast, that's an entirely different conversation than having, Hey, can I sell you things? Right. Yes. But after that, you do become friends because you're sitting here talking, you're learning their life story. You're sharing your life story. You know, you're, you're talking about some of the big accomplishments that you have. And it's just a wonderful, warm way to get to know somebody. And that's always got to be the first step of, you know, do you want to do business with somebody is, you know, do you guys like each other? Can you trust each other? Are you both experts at what you do? And okay, well, let's look at a partnership. Absolutely. I have found in all and all my decades of doing this, that there is no better way to start a new relationship in a way that is not perceived as selling than a podcast interview. I love it. So started with cold calling, wrote a book, 
kind of found out, hey, this is a secret sauce that works. This is a great way to get in front of people. Turn that into a coaching business. And all of this is happening while virtual environments are exploding and the internet seeing 23,000% growth every year. And it's just, it's crazy out there. How has that affected this process? Obviously podcasting now, instead of just writing a book, um, but you know, you said you started with, with snail mail, right? So what are you coaching advisors to do today that is different than when you first started? Sure. And again, we didn't start out doing it as a podcast because podcast didn't exist right, right. then. It was literally just an in-person interview on an Office Depot voice recorder that we repurposed and transcribed because there was no social media to air it on and there was no podcast platform back then. So the biz- the fundamentals of human psychology, marketing is two things. It's, you know, you talk about it. It's behavioral psych, why people do the things they do, and it's math. Now, the principles of why people do the things they do, the psychology has not changed at all. The media ways we have to reach them has, as you mentioned, exploded exponentially. And there's a new social network every couple of weeks now that we get shiny object syndrome and all want to get on. So I think what's changed, a portion of our business model has changed in that more and more advisors want it done for them. They don't want to be coached. They don't want to learn how to do it themselves. The majority of our clients want us want to write a check and want us to go do all the work so that they just reap the rewards and don't have to put in the time, which thankfully now we have the man and woman power to do, and we're happy to serve. I think the other thing that the the biggest thing has changed is the number of ways we have to reach people now. It is easier as a financial advisor to grow a practice now than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I mean, all I had was I could run print ads in magazines and newspapers. I could send out direct mail or I could make cold calls. I mean, I guess you could have, you TV and radio existed. I didn't have, I did I certainly didn't have the budget when I started to do TV or radio, but those were basically the four or five ways you had to reach people. And that was it. And they all cost significant amounts of time and money. Right and now you could do a Facebook live. You could do a LinkedIn live. You could be on clubhouse. You could do so many different ways that cost next to nothing to reach your target market. It's easier than it's ever been. And there are individual shows on YouTube that get more views than NBC. It's, yes. it's crazy. And it's just free, right? Or you have to sign up for a business account for a hundred bucks a year or something crazy like that. But there's, there's absolutely ways to get out in front of your ideal prospects and to build a following if you have good quality content out there. And where do you get content that will attract your ideal prospect? Well, hey, probably from one of your ideal prospects, right? Absolutely. I think the beauty of it is you don't even need to create the content yourself. You can literally interview your ideal prospects or referral sources, and they'll create the content for you. They'll tell you their pain points. They'll tell you the biggest challenges and mistakes people make. They'll tell you what they're struggling with because it's an interview format. They will literally give you everything you need to know to either build that referral relationship or close the business at a later date. Absolutely. I mean, you could, if you could just tap into their pain points, find out what they're dealing with, then you know how to speak to that audience. And I think that's something that a lot of professionals, you know, struggle with sometimes is they know their solutions. This, this is my solution, but they don't focus enough on the problem. And the best way to do that is to learn the problem from your ideal prospect. Absolutely. That it's made research so easy we have, I can show you case study after case study and market after market where we've literally interviewed the people, used the exact language they said in the interview, fed it back to them and later, and they said, oh my God, that's exactly what I want. You know, I've had people go, do you have a webcam in my house? I've had people say, how did you know? That's so incredible. Yes, that's exactly what I need help with. And I didn't, don't want to say, well, you told me two weeks ago. Yeah, I listened. Right? right. I listened. No, they assume nobody's <laughs> listening or paying attention. Right. I mean, that's that's probably the most underrated tool a any sales professional has in their in their back pocket is just Absolutely. listen. Absolutely. I mean, we got two ears and one mouth for a reason. The, the ratio of two ears to one mouth is not an accident. Yep. I um, was working with Jeremiah Demeray yep. uh, a while back, and he's he's fantastic at that stuff. He's great at it. And one phrase he always 
um, suggested you use is you you feed them back what they said to you and and you clarify it. You say, well, this is what I'm hearing you say. And then you you give it back to them and you let them correct you or you let them agree with you or you let them totally disagree. And then you can get more aligned with how that presentation is going, how the sales call is going, what problems you've unsurfaced in their in their life that you can come with a solution for. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. This podcast is brought to you by White Gloves Podcast Connect Program, a done-for-you, fully integrated podcasting system that will help you keep in touch with all of your leads. Well, all right, buddy. What is what is next for you guys? I mean, you and I have talked about the just the massive opportunities that you're seeing out there with you know transforming podcasts into books and and using that to drive in nice, warm prospects that call you, right? I love that idea of how do you get referrals every single week without ever asking, right? That's that's kind of your specialty, right? So what what is that next step with with Seth? What is the what is on the horizon for you guys? I think we will, our, our core offering will always remain the same in terms of, you know, referrals are the easiest to conduct business with, right? They know who you are, the trust from your client transfers to them, they convert into clients at a much higher rate, and they're prone to refer more because that's how they got in the door. I think our offering, we're always working to make it better. So originally, it was all about just the referrals. And then I, we had advisors say, hey, that's great. But hey, can we get some exposure out of this? And we tell people, hey, if you're doing 50 interviews, 50 weeks in a row, I don't care if 50 people, the 50 people who you interview, the only ones who listen to the show, as long as we turn those 50 relationships into profits. But then it started with my wife because she's a podcaster too. And she started saying, but I want downloads. I want downloads. And enough clients asked, despite our telling them it's not about the downloads, that we had to create a podcast advertising service that now works to drive more traffic to their shows. So we're always iterating, we're always innovating. I think there will be more ways to repurpose content. There will be more ways, more social media, more networks to attract the ideal clients. If you go back in time, if you think about it, TV started out as three channels and now there's over 500 and you can find a, a whole channel devoted to just about almost everything. I mean, there's an entire channel 24 hours a day of fishing. So as, <laughs> as the marketplace splinters and becomes more fragmented and more specialized, I think social media is going to do the same thing. I think we will eventually not just see Facebook groups for specific interests. I think we will eventually see whole social networks pop up to cater to specific target markets, which makes our jobs as advisors and marketers a lot easier. And the toughest part of staying top of mind on any of those platforms is content creation. And I think your system of grabbing content directly from your ideal prospect and having them tell you what they want to hear about, what they want to talk about is naturally, I mean, it, it's just a, an amazing idea because anybody that out there that's, that's trying to stay relevant on LinkedIn or Facebook or anything like that, it's always, well, what do I post next? But if you run a podcast and then you have content off that podcast and now it's a book and there's excerpts from that, I mean, the, the content writes itself. And that is the number one hurdle to get over when it comes to social media. Absolutely. I think it, it definitely, I mean, it creates, you've got blog posts and books and eBooks and video and audio, and there's so many different ways to repurpose that content. You could literally do one interview a week and have all the content you needed for all seven days. And one of the things that is just so interesting about that is, you know, a lot of people always say, well, I need fresh stuff. I need new stuff. I, I need X, Y, and Z. And really, if you can take a podcast and turn it into a book, turn it into a white paper, turn it into a, a download of X, Y, and Z, turn it into an expert, a meme, it doesn't necessarily have to be brand new content every single time because I might read a white paper, but I'll never listen to a podcast or I might listen to a podcast, but I'm never going to read the book. So you're hitting different audiences that all have those same pain points, but you're hitting them with different mediums. And that is so important now, especially with all the, all the distractions. When someone picks up their phone, which app do they like to go to first? And how do they like to ingest their content? You can use that same piece of content across a lot of platforms and hit a lot, a lot more people than you ever have been able to in the past. So it's funny, you're absolutely right. I had the, because again, as you mentioned, people want to consume it different ways. So it's not that you might think, oh, I already aired that. That's the same thing. 
but they didn't hear it on every single platform. It is new to them. So literally you've got, I am now taking some of my, uh, some of our, we're, we're testing out our first, you know, iPhone and Android app based off of the content created from a podcast. So there may be people who don't go to iTunes and listen to it, go, don't go to YouTube and watch it, but they'll consume it inside an app in the app store. So there's different audiences migrate to different places. So you got to be everywhere all the time. You got to be omnipresent. Well, Seth, thank you so much for being on today. I mean, this is a ton of powerful content. I highly suggest anybody listening, go check out Seth's podcast as well. Check out his show. He's got some great content out there. For our listeners today, Seth, if you had one first step that they should be taking, an action item that they should absolutely focus on today, what do you think that should be? Got it. You, I think you got to start with defining your target market. I think most advisors get this way too broad. They say, I want baby boomers with money. Well, so does every single advisor. And that doesn't differentiate you. I think the first place to start is how do we narrow down that micro niche target market so that literally maybe there's only a couple thousand people in it and I can, I mean, you guys do this with your seminars and your workshop. It's, hey, would you rather send one invitation to 20,000 people or would you rather send, take a group of 5,000 and send them four in a row, you know, because you got a much better, if I have four bullets to shoot at the same target, I got a much better shot of hitting it than I do if I only have one shot. I love that. Well, thank you very much, sir. And I'm sure we'll have to bring you back on and, and do this again very soon. Uh, yeah, I would love to come back and have you back on our show for episode two as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor to be here. Seth Green and Brad Swinehart, the host of Be Advised, Leading with Value. Follow this podcast to get the latest show and impress your family and friends by sharing. This podcast is brought to you by White Gloves Podcast Connect Program a done-for-you, fully integrated podcasting system that will help you keep in touch with all of your leads. Thank you for listening to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of White Glove. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.